Like I said, I take great pride in that we actually don't charge people. I always hated asking people for money, particularly when my clients are hard, you know, already suffering. And I'm very happy that not only for myself, but I able to build a practice where when people come to us with trouble, we are here to try and help you out, try and solve problems, try and get money for our clients. Uh, I'm Jewish, Lifshitz, we like to say we're the mitzvah machine. So people come to us and we try and do mitzvahs. And here I am, 17 and almost 18 years later, and now it's not just me, but we have a whole firm, and we deal with people and do this as a regular basis. That's the background. So one of the things that I like to do when I meet my clients is I really don't want to just help them out, but I want to help them empower them to help themselves. Tonight's presentation is really about learning how to empower yourselves. So that if you ever come to a tenant attorney, someone like myself or any of these other nonprofits that are out there to help you, what you're doing is you're going and you've already done the background work of what we want our clients to do. Uh, an example of empowering clients, I never want to write the letters to my clients when they come to us with problems. There are a lot of nonprofits here who will cause a hoosta. They'll help and they'll write a letter for you and they'll put it on their letterhead. I want people to feel the strength of writing your own letters. So when my clients come to me, I have them draft a draft of a letter. I will help elevate it maybe, put it in some good language, but I have them send a letter to their landlord because I want them to be able to say that I know how to stand up for myself, I can give a letter under my name, I'm a person who can represent myself. Now, of course, when it gets to the lawyer level, and if I get involved as a lawyer, I like to have letters from my client to the landlord. So, for example, if I'm in a jury trial, I'm not going to say to the jury, the, the, put my client up there and say, this is the letter my, la my attorney wrote. For me. Instead, my client could stand at the trial and say, this is the letter I wrote my landlord demanding that they do what's right. And they didn't do it. So that goes to the idea of empowerment, and what I'm going to kind of go through is just the basic elements of how to empower yourselves as tenants if a landlord does something wrong, okay? Um, we'll start with our first one. So the first one on our checklist is documentation. Who can think of a way that you can document your problems? Don't look at the pictures. <laughs> I, heard, I heard videotape. Video what? What does that mean? A video of the apartment video. You used to talk about mold, mildew. Yeah, so we'll go with... For photographs, right? If you have problems, you want to document things. You want to create, legal term, evidence. Most people understand that term, okay? So when there are problems, you want to create documentation. What's another way you could document things? Don't look. I looked. Okay, you can look, and now you can still come up with something. Somebody in the peanut gallery. Okay, another way is you can keep a journal, okay? It is helpful in, in legal terms, what we call this our contemporaneous, contemporaneous notes. It's actually another word for it. But when you write something down contemporaneous with it happening, in the law, it has more impact. If you look back at something and you say, on May 5th, or on March 25th, my ceiling fell in and I wrote a note about it and this is what I felt and this is what I saw, that has more legal impact than if you do it six months later and you're writing it down. Because you wrote it when it happened. So a journal, when you're dealing with a bad landlord or problems, is very helpful. It has more legal significance for your lawyer when you go to the lawyer. And again, a lot of what I'm doing here is so that if you ever get to the point where you come to a lawyer like myself or one of the services, you've already empowered yourself by following these techniques. That's what today is about, understanding ways to empower yourself. So another one are inspections. Having a third party come out and inspect your property. Okay, so you know, the landlord, just some basic law, basic understanding, I think you kind of, most people have a general appreciation. The state, the county, the cities, all have different laws that require your landlord to maintain your home in a safe and habitable condition. Right? When you sign a lease, what you're doing, this is just a basic, a good principle to understand. You sign a lease, you're saying, I'm paying you X amount of dollars, a thousand dollars a month. That's supposed to get laughs. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you sign your lease for whatever your amount is, and what you're saying to the landlord is, I agree to pay you this amount of money, and in exchange, you're going to give me a place that meets all of the requirements of the state and local law. All the health and safety requirements, the building code, the housing code, that is the equivalency that is mandated, that is implied in your lease agreement. I pay you this, you give me this. When, when you're paying your landlord your rent, and he has failed to provide you all of those levels that are required under the law, you're not getting what you paid for. We're going to get to this down the road, but this is something you can try and recover. It's called a service, and it's called a reduction in service. When your landlord hasn't provided you what you're entitled to. And the best way to get a reduction in service, to make a claim that you're overpaying your rent, is to document what you're not getting. 
Okay, because down the road, even if you don't deal with the landlord about it, just taking those pictures and making those notes, this is going to prepare you for down the road when you get to the point that you're having a dispute. Because you can show what was going on. All right, I'm not going to go to the next slide because the next slide has is tricked. Let me see what I put. Okay, next one. Next one is called notice. And I'm going to go back. Oh, this is this way. See, okay, you can look at mine. I'm sorry. On mine, I don't have the picture. Next one is notice to your landlord. It's good to document stuff because that way you can show what was going on. But really, you need to make sure your landlord knows what was going on. Okay? So what are some ways you can provide your landlord notice that there is, say, a leaky roof? Email. Letter. Email. Oh, there we just got three. Phone call. Email. Letter. Phone calls are great and they really are, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of talking to your landlord. It really helps people have a better tone when there's actually in person. As we sometimes learn, when people don't have actual discussions, sometimes people don't quite have the same relationship with each other that they might otherwise have when they're talking one on one. So when you have a phone call, you want to document that phone call. And this is a great technique that everyone should, be, should kind of put in, their, in their, their bag of tricks that I'm giving you. You call the landlord and you say, you know, I'm having a leaky roof, this is the problem. But of course, down the road, you can't count on your landlord agreeing that that's what happened. Every time you call the landlord, which is a great first step, you then follow up with the written documentation. Dear landlord, as you know, today we talked about, and I called you today and told you about X, a leaky roof. You told me why. You haven't inspected. I look forward to hearing about the result. Thank you. Every time you call your landlord and speak to him, you should, and particularly if you know that you're getting to the point where you have a dispute. But there's no reason not to have that follow-up. This is what we talked about. This is what you said. This is what I said. This is where we left it. Simple techniques like that, so when you go back to a lawyer because there's a problem down the road, you have everything the lawyer needs to show that they were on notice. Because notice, is, documentation is your first level. You're doing that for yourself. But you need to give your landlord notice of the problems. Because if a landlord says, I never knew, it's his defense. So, and then you say, well, I, and, and most often people say, well, I talk to the landlord all the time. We're now in this age where you can always call your landlord, and now we can go to the next slide. Right. So we, we covered mail, email, text. The stuff doesn't go away. It's great. Okay? Um, telephone is a great way to start, and I, and I encourage you, you know, it's good to try and have the dialogue. Okay? Um, now we have also the social media. This goes kind of back to the journaling thing. I'm not on Facebook, I've heard all about it, but apparently like, that's a place you can kind of post things to your friends about what's going on. If you post something to your friends, you create a documentation, right? Hey, I emailed your friend, I'm dealing with my landlord, this is what's going on in my life. Anytime you've done that, you've shown something, if it's contemporaneous with when it happened. If you write your friends the thing on Facebook and said, six months ago I had this problem, it doesn't have the same value because it's not taken right then. Okay, it, it, it's got value, it's your story, but from a, from a lawyer's point of view, we want stuff right when it happens. We want you to have the, oh, I just spoke to you, this just happened, this is what's going on right now. All right, so that's our, our checkpoint number two. And, da, da, da. okay, see here I had that blow falling in so I could, I could hit you guys up. All right, number three, advocates. This is, this is, a, a, it, it always shocks me that most people don't know about the tremendous amount of advocates. We are in San Francisco. We have more nonprofits, more advocates out there to help people for no charge than anywhere else. We have the strongest laws in the entire country to protect tenants. We have the more systems in place for you to prevent anyone from having to deal with a bad landlord. And you, as a tenant in your rent control apartment, have more power than any tenant anywhere. Okay, that is what San Francisco, that is why I can make a living, we can make a living, is because these laws are so strong and have such penalties that we can go after the landlords and get money for you and still be able to make a living to keep our, our, our ship afloat. So, one of the advocates that a lot of people don't know about is your building inspection department. Okay? Um, I have a flyer out there that has some of the summaries of this information and includes the phone numbers for, for this as well. Easy to find. So, how many people know, have heard of the San Francisco Department of Building Inspections? How many people have called them? I got one in the back, I got Vince in the back, I got one in the front. So what happens when you call them? They take a report. They say they have for lucky. That'd be lucky. Then, yeah, and uh, then they send something to the landlord. 
They are your best advocate. And then something if, happens. <laughs> if you call the city of San Francisco, the building department, without telling your landlord you don't need to, they will come out within two to three days, typically. They, uh, you call up and they make a complaint. They take your information. A complaint is now generated and assigned to your building inspector. This town is broken up into divisions and there's a building inspector in every town. That building inspector now has an open complaint and it's their job to get it closed. And their supervisor is going to be looking at how many open complaints they have. They will come out for free. They will inspect your home. If they find no problems, they will go away and your landlord doesn't have to know anything. They're not going to tell your landlord. They don't involve your landlord. It's not there. If there's any problem, they will write off a violation. They will serve it on the landlord. They will tell the landlord he has to fix it and they will be coming back. It takes the fight out of your hands. You have an issue with your landlord, it's great to call and try and document them to fix it. If they're giving you shit, don't worry, don't waste your energy. Pass the buck to your city services, okay? Once they open that notice violation, they will follow up and they will do everything and they will keep you posted. And you can have a personal relationship with your inspector whose job it is is to make sure that your house meets all of these local laws for keeping the water out, for keeping the rodents out, Another one is your health department. And if you call either one of these, they'll decide who's the right one. But the San Francisco, San Francisco Department of Public Health, DPH, they deal with your bed bugs, your rodents, you know, things that spread disease. Building department deals with your plumbing, your electrical, your, you know, your roof, all the other problems about building roads. If you call one and they come out, they'll send it to the other one. So you don't have to worry too much. But if they're two different departments, they're both staffed with investigators whose job it is, and, and they can't ignore it because once you call, the person on the phone immediately creates a claim. You can go online from the government website and follow your claim and see everything that they do because every day they go back from their office and they fill out every place they went to and the status of every complaint. And you can sit there and track what's going on. You don't have to fight with the landlord and you're no longer responsible. Separate and apart, we have this really cool thing in California that says that if you contact a government agency, you insulate yourself. It's a retaliation statute. If your landlord, six months, six months after you call one of these departments, if your landlord takes any step to evict you, to raise your rent, to do anything that you otherwise probably try and do, then it is presumed he's retaliated against you. There's a presumption. Well, we have presumptions. Presumptions mean that it's your burden to, to overcome. Normally it's your burden to, to, to show that your landlord is harassing. But if you call the bill of a public agency, the presumption is now that the landlord is harassing you with something he does to you. So it actually insulates you more. If you're fighting with your landlord without that, you don't have that protection. But the moment you call the government agency, you kick in say, California's retaliation statute to protect you. And it's just one more way to get people like me an ability to increase your claim. Because if you do that, and then retaliate, there are additional penalties that you have to go after these animals and I can use. Okay. Additionally, of course, there are a ton of nonprofits. And most of these nonprofits will direct you to the right type of person. I threw up here the Eviction Defense Collaborative. I forgot to mention. Um, I'm also the president of the board of the Eviction Defense Collaborative. And I'm lucky enough to have two of our wonderful volunteers. Are you both volunteers? Two of our volunteers. So here's another little, a little nugget of fun fact for San Francisco. The Eviction Defense Collaborative started 22 years ago. Every, every person in this town that gets evicted through an or a, a, a working thing we did with the court, if you get an eviction notice, the court of San Francisco will send you a letter telling you to come to us, the EDC. This doesn't happen in other counties. This is a San Francisco, a wonderful little aspect of our protected tenants. It will send you to us. Every person in this town that gets evicted, doesn't matter what nonprofit you go to, they're going to send you to our clinic. Our clinic is open five days a week, six hours a day. You walk in with your papers saying if you have five days when you're evicted to file papers with the court or you will be ejected from home. You walk into our clinic, you walk out, a lawyer's reviewed and helped you prepare papers to protect your rights so that you have the whole process to go through to maintain your rights. 97% of every, of every eviction that's capital in San Francisco comes to our shop. Okay. We have volunteers like Nico here, Carly, um, who help run our clinic. Uh, we are funded primarily from San Francisco, the county of San Francisco. And um, it is really one of these, it's like a triage center for evictions. 
And we're also always happy to get volunteers, people looking to try to actually do some outreach with some community groups, because our clinic is always packed with people who are in peril of losing their home. And what we do then is then we hand the buck off to many of these other nonprofits, do that triage to make sure it's not bleed, and then to pass it along. So I come up here, Strut, who's been generous enough to host us here tonight for our first seminar, the AIDS and Google referral panel, one of our sponsors for tonight. Again, many organizations that you find one, and they'll get you to the right one. We have Cosmo Busto, we have the Chinatown Community Development Center, um, we have 50 Plus Network, which is again trying to organize and mobilize the tremendous amount of resources and nonprofits here in San Francisco. <coughs> the point is, is that you have an advocate. So empower yourself in one way is to reach out to your advocates and have them help you create the record so that you are not sitting there behind the eight ball with the landlord and you have an issue. Okay, and then the last thing are rent board petitions. This is again for empowerment and self self advocacy. So we have a rent board in San Francisco. Most places don't have this. The rent board is a quasi judicial body. It just kind of means that it's a it, it has the right over certain aspects of your relationship with your landlord. Now remember I talked about that you pay your rent and you're entitled to the services that match the rent. And the services are set by the state law. When the building department comes out and they issue a violation, they are saying, per se, you are not getting those services. Every item on that violation is a reduction in the service the landlord is required to give you under the law. Okay? So if you get a violation, you have a document from the government agency saying your landlord did, that you overpaid your rent. Unless your landlord gave you a break on your rent, you paid too much rent. Anytime you've documented a violation under their building department, or you will show that there was a problem with your unit. Now, a lawyer like me, you know, we, we can't make a living trying to help people with these small claims. What we can try to do is teach you guys how to do it yourself. And the rent board has a very simple petition process. And the way it is this, I'm kind of giving you an example of an eviction. The standard defense to anyone being evicted in this town that needs an EDC, landlord says you're not paying your rent cause an eviction against you. Maybe you had a hard time or something. Um, we go and we say, are there any problems with your home? Is there a leaky roof? Is there an outlet that isn't working? Is there a fan in the bathroom that isn't working? Because when the landlord evicts you, they say, Joe owes me $1,000. So laughing. <laughs> Joe owes me $1,000 for my rent. And he didn't pay. The defense to that is, if we were to go to a jury trial, is to say, there was a problem with you it was worth less than $1,000. Now, a, a eviction is required for the landlord to say exactly how much you owe. And because the state doesn't want people to lose their homes, it requires that that is exactly right. If it is $1 too much, you win your eviction. So when you're being evicted, the EDC can say, tell us about all the problems. Maybe you've been to one of my seminars, and you say, I've been documenting my problems. I've been giving notes to the landlord. Here's the letters I gave him about the leaky you know, bathtub or about the, uh, the roof that was water's coming in the grains. That's great, that's evidence. But what we go with them and say is, okay, the landlord asked for that rent, but he didn't provide all the services. So he's actually entitled to less than that rent. And if a jury goes to a jury trial, and the jury says, yeah, well, that leaky roof, that should take off 10% of the rent for that month. And that's $100. They, they only really owe $900. The tenant wins. The, law, the eviction loses, and the tenant would have to pay the amount the jury would say. Okay, so that is the defense that we do for all of our evictions, is to try to show that the landlord is asking for too much money because there's some problem he hasn't fixed. And it allows us to have a negotiating room, because in most cases we can negotiate a settlement. But you don't want to have to go to a jury trial to get that $100 back. And that's why the better thing, you know, some people say, you can say to your landlord, I'm not paying you my rent unless you fix this problem. It's a very adversarial and aggressive thing, and I don't recommend it. Rather, you go and you document the problems, you go through the checklist we did here, you write the landlord letters, you show that he knew about the problems because you emailed him, you talked to him and said, this is what we said on the phone. And then you get a petition, and the petition is really easy to fill out, and the people at the rent board, which is on a bad lesson market, will actually help you. And any nonprofit you can walk in with you. And you list all the problems, when they began, when they were fixed. That's why it's good if you get the building department involved, because they will actually give you a date that you know is a problem, and a date you know is fixed. And with a rent board petition, you do what's called a reduction in service petition. And you say, I lived in this apartment for X number of months, 
and these are the problems, and then you come up with your own number. You say, I think I'm entitled for each of these problems to 5% off my rent over this six month period. So in six months I paid $6,000. Here's 10 problems, the rats that have been going around on the ground building, uh, the lock that was broken, whatever the problems are, and for each one of them you get to say, this is how much I want to be reduced. The rent board, without charging you, is going to set up a hearing. And they will petition your landlord, and there will be an actual hearing with a, a, a rent board commissioner, or a mediator, they get to commissioners eventually. Um, and they will decide how much your rent should be reduced. And then they credit that on your rent going forward. That's the power of our rent board. So when you endure problems, you don't need to get a lawyer involved. You can empower, be empowered, you can go on your own, and you can say, this is how I've been overpaying the rent. Because I learned at this tenant's rent day lease seminar that when I pay rent, I'm supposed to get everything without a problem. My home is supposed to be safe, habitable, and functioning in the accordance with the law. And I'll tell you, there is a minutia code for every aspect of your home. You know, your electrical, one of your outlets isn't working, that's a code violation. You know, if your electric outlets aren't even grounded, that's a code violation. If your window isn't closing, that's a code violation. All of these things are a way for you to recover. It's nice to just try and put it out to your landlord yourself and say, hey, I understand that I actually just want to get some credits, why don't you just give me a credit? I'd say, my own building, I just have a, I'm a rent control tenant, which is frankly the only way I've ever been able to build up my business. I live in the Tenderloin. And we had a, this one, this is the first one, this is going on my life. We had the, the door wasn't locking, you know, the gate, the two gates, right? The main gate wasn't locking. So I sent a picture to my landlord and said, my manager said, hey, they put a post it. Please close the gate firmly. Okay, I said, hey, that's actually not sufficient because actually nobody keeps doing it and the gate keeps coming up, so please do it. I got a response, okay, we're working on it. A week later, still not there, somebody walked into our thing, took a crowbar, and bent open all the mailboxes and took everyone's mail. I now have a giant gaping hole in the mailbox and I emailed the landlord again and I said, you know, this is, this is bad. You need to do something about this. this not acceptable. Here's a picture that I just took on my phone and I'm sending to you. And what I said actually is, uh, it's just going on. This is kind of my response. I said I got an email from a landlord's attorney because they know me and I've been in court with him a lot. Maybe you've heard of David Wasserman. Okay, he's a very well-known landlord attorney. He's actually one of our commissioners now on our rent court. Um, anyway, I got an email from David and I said, okay, they got your letter. They're going to work on it. I said, David. Give me this seminar called Tenants Rights Made Easy. And I'd like, I'd like you to do something nice for my building. And if not, I'm going to host one here in the building. What I'm going to suggest is, in addition to fixing this problem promptly, that spring is coming, and maybe you, the landlords, want to do a little courtesy and go up and we have a backyard. It's kind of unusual to the one. We actually have a backyard with trees and it's all concealed. I said, it's time to do some gardening. We can use some sprucing up for the lawn, maybe some wood chips, and how about a few chairs? And I wouldn't have to go and advocate for every tenant in this building how you guys have screwed them if maybe you do a little nice thing and, and spruce the place up a little bit. Actually, I haven't gotten a response yet, so I'm waiting to, 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 to see how it goes. But my expectation is I feel like rather than everyone having a, 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 a dozen petitions to get back a few whatever the hundreds of dollars are, I, I think everyone will benefit from just having a nice year. Not really, it's either here or there. It's a story, but, you know. All right, so anyway. Those are kind of the basics of what, we're, what I want to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to take questions, and I've got some fun slides that I'm going to put on here just to show us. We actually have a lot of fun going after bad language. So what we do, my, my office, <coughs> what I'm talking to you guys about is really about how to advocate yourself. If it gets so bad, a lot of my clients, asthma, respiratory problems, emergency room visits, where the problem is so bad, particularly in the immigrant population, the really low income, who really endure some of the most hardships, Often our clients have to give up their rent control apartments. Well, you know, if you're ever in a rent control apartment, you are sitting on an extremely valuable asset. And of course, that's why your landlord wants you up. Okay? Um, just to give you a little basic understanding about how it works, if you're paying that $1,000 a month rent because you've been there for 20 years like me in your 10 wide apartment, and they'd love to get rid of me, and his email said, by the way, do you still live there? <laughs> and I said, until you see me retired, so I'm not working in the city, you would expect that I'm living a half mile from my, my office in the Hayes Valley. So if you're paying this $1,000 a month rent and you move out because your landlord has refused to do what he needs to do, you document it well, and he goes back and he says, now I'm going to rent out for $3,000 a month, 
you can still get some laughs into that. This is called a rent differential. The difference between what you pay and what your apartment is worth on the open market, that's what you save every month that you live in your rent control park. So if your apartment's worth three thousand dollars, which is easy and common at this time, then you could be saving two thousand dollars a month because you're in a rent control apartment. But that's why your landlord looks at you and says, you're costing me $2,000 a month. Under the law, you get to sue your landlord and say, I want that $2,000 a month. For every month, I would have lived in that apartment. 12 months? How much? 24,000. 10 years? 240,000. That's how I make it. Going after landlords for what people really want, which is the equity, the value that you earn, almost like being a homeowner. It really is. You know, in California, you have this Prop 16, which says you can't raise taxes on the homeowners. Right? The landlord's taxes don't go up. Taxes, and you are paying more rent. And when the landlord gets to get rid of you, he gets to keep paying low taxes, but he gets all that extra rent. So when you lose your home, you get that difference for every month, every year you were living. And then under our rent ordinance, which is why we're so strong here in San Francisco, it says if your landlord is a real asshole, you know, that's he documented what he needed to do, and he just wouldn't do it. In the legal terms, we say he acted in bad faith. Whatever that number is, we get to do triple. That $2,000 a month is $6,000 a month. So $72,000 a year. You see the jurors that you live in for 10 years? $720,000. We compromise, we settle, we are, you know, to get cases. But, Get someone who's a rectal apartment. They should be getting a quarter million dollars or more for losing your squalid apartment that your landlord has refused to fix up. So that's how my firm makes a living, is helping people convert the suffering they went through into an opportunity to go forward. We also do help with the squalid cases and demands and other things like that, but it's because of the law here that is so strong that we get to actually represent people where I don't have to charge anyone when they come into my door. I can say, I can help you, and I can make it better for you. I had some fun slides, and now I'm going to do questions because I didn't really get them in as I wanted. Stories. So I, I live in Ace Valley. Yeah, I've been in the apartment for 22 years. You know that apartment, that neighborhood was like 22 years ago. I also in Ace Valley, I've been 18 years, but yes. Yeah. Um, the, um, the landlord knows, I think, in terms of my units. Um, the apartment I'm in, really hasn't been renovated since the 70s. And I want to initiate the conversation. Um, I'm not sure how to approach it. And I don't want to be adversarial. I don't want to be, hey, you know, I'd like you to come over and invite the questions I have. But, now, unfortunately, one, it's exactly what you should do. You should initiate the conversation. You should try and be you know, you should try and be fair about it, try and see it again. Unfortunately, you can't force a landlord to make a place renovated. And that's what they, what they do. They try and make the places run now. Um, I've even tweaked out, I've seen the most, the most uh, reprehensible situation where somebody actually upgraded their kitchen. Actually, a couple gay guys, gay tenants, uh, they were clients of ours after the fact. Um, and they were evicted for doing renovations without the landlord's consent because the lease, a lot of these leases have it, have a provision to say you cannot do any repairs for renovations. And these guys spent $10,000 putting granite countertops in their kitchen in a 20-some-year apartment, and they had a jury trial, and the jury threw them out. Yeah, that's my fear. I, I, I would do it. Well, so that, that's the If it's in your lease, so that's where you start with it. And then, I mean, nonetheless, there are things that they do with it. A carpet that's 20 years old, the building department will cite them for that. Floors that are just, you know, so uh, deteriorated, they will cite that for them. Windows, I just did mine. So my, my 20 year apartment, the windows, when the rain came, we tried to, um, we tried to open it. When the heat came, we tried to open the upper ones to go down during the heat wave this summer. And literally the whole glass almost fell off because the wood was so rotted. So, so I, you know, I, I think, I think nothing. So I, I'm like willing to work with it and I'm willing to do uh, some of the rendition myself. My fear is what you just said. Well, that's when you do what you're not allowed to do. Yeah. As long as you don't violate your right, your, the, you know, what you're allowed to do, then you are sitting in the cabinet seat. 
That's what I say. So starting the conversation and saying, hey, you know, this car hasn't been in place in 20 years. I know it's really responsibility, but I, I'll do it. You know, um, because I've been here for so long. Like that type of conversation, that goodwill. You know, what happens is that if you, if you sell the original landlord, as opposed to a lot of times what happens is the property transfers to the kids, because the landlord passed away, and then the kids, you never get them to, you know, squeeze the blood for a turnip or whatever it is. So like, they won't do anything for you. So, a couple that operated their kitchen, they got kicked out of my kitchen. Here's the actual story. So I was sitting there, I was actually doing a jury trial, and it was we were called to that judge. And we went there and they said, when that case is over, your trial is up. And it was an eviction trial, we were not an eviction trial, but that's not we were defended. And I sat there and I watched the jury give this verdict. And my stomach turned. And they had all these other defenses about habitability and the land and all the fight and everything else. And they lost their own. And when they walked out, I gave them my card, and I said that, first of all, one of the jurors walked by, and I made, I, I made a spiritual comment to him in terms of legal temper. Um, I made a spiritual comment to the juror who who, um, who just throw this couple out. And I gave them my card, and I said, I want to do something. And I then represented them for going after their landlord for the industrial service claim, which is that they had all, they operated in the park because the place was falling apart. And then I went and I got them like 50 grand because I went after the landlord for that because I have the privilege of being able to represent where the hell I want and if I see real injustice. So yes, these people, this couple did lose their home. It was devastating. They'd been there for over 20 years and the landlord, um, was just a real SOV, and I got to make him a little miserable, and that is it's a whole story. Okay. Yeah. So, so my fear is that just nothing that didn't save them at all. But and, and then they were, they, and when I was always, I was like, I, was like I, I can't say, I can't fix this. I can just try and do something. So I guess my fear is that you know I have a conversation, and he sees it, and I'm, I say I want to do this, and he approves it, and then. Okay. <coughs> That's it, then you put it right. You're a landlord. It was great meeting with you today. I really appreciate your agreeing that I can do X, Y, Z. If you have any problems, let me know. You know, I appreciate it. That is your document. Then you're then you're the clear. Because all that, you don't you know you don't need a contract to approve. The oral is fine, but you just want that little confirmation confirmation email. You know, that's why that's how you keep it really easy going. You know, we talk about it, especially people on the phone. Because when you start with the phone, you can have the real conversation, and then you just send a friendly email away. You know, a, a, a confirmation. You know, this confirms today you agree. It was great meeting you today. You know, I use the language like more loyally, confirms it. It was nice seeing you today. I really appreciate you letting me upgrade my kitchen. And I appreciate that you're gonna fix that leaky this or the other things that we talked about, you know. And then when the landlord won't do anything for you and you give it your best shot, then call the building department. And like I said, if they say there's nothing they can do, they don't go and say, hey, your tech called me, I said, go pound sand. They never call them. They only get in touch with the landlord if there's something to do. And that's great after you have a conversation where he says, I'm not going to do anything. And then you write the email though, says, landlord, this confirms that you said you know that, that it wasn't your fault, you were supposed to do fix that. I really hoped you would have fixed it. And then you call the email. <coughs> call the notifications that you say you can send an email or a text message or a phone call or a written notice. Do they have the same way? when you bring the case before the court, the, the email as opposed to the written notice that it will send. They really do. Because I know that they, they do. They really do. Everyone yeah. thinks, do I have to send a certified? Right. But the only thing you really need is to know you got it. So what I would do is when they don't respond, if they respond to your email, you have done 150% all you need to do. If they don't respond to your email, then I take it and I reply again, because you you BCC yourself. That's the easiest way, right? So you got it, you know, reply again and say, hey, I just wanted to confirm your dollars. All you really need is for to know, to have a confirmation that they received it. You don't need this idea of, you know, that that's what they have like the uh, you know certified mail and everything else. All you're trying to do is show that they got it. So if it's on an email or a text and they don't respond, you send it again. And you keep doing it and you say, you know, why don't you respond? I just I want to know this isn't in your junk mail. Please confirm you got this. You know? As soon as they say, yep, I got it, you're good. Yeah, there's no magical power over 
different forms of communication. It's just about notes. Yeah, just have a pair that it has to be in writing and a piece of paper. You said lots of people think that. Yeah, this is, this is a fun one. I have people like I don't have a lease, and I want to force my landlord to give me a lease. All a lease does is take away your rights. If you look at a lease agreement, it is an itemization of reducing your rights that are already given to you as a tenant under law. Okay, so leases are not your friends. Leases don't give you. Your <coughs> Uh, if you, all leases is an itemization of things that are not. If the lease isn't there, then there's nothing to say you can't have friends over for a certain amount of time. There's nothing to say that you have to pay uh, your TV bill and they're not paying you. Everything in the lease is just a way for the landlord to take away what you have as your right as a tenant. As soon as they accept your money and you've been there 30 days, you're a tenant and you've got all the rights in the world. And then all the leases are just a way of restricting. So it's better not have a lease? It is better not to have a lease than have proof that your landlord is accepting your rent. There's nothing in a lease that is going to make your, okay, if you now go look at your lease, you'll see that it is just an itemization of restrictions of your rights. Because all of your rights are naturally given to you by the state, by the, the city government. And a lease is just a way. And that's why a lease that says like, you are not a right controlled tenant. Well, we have laws that say you can't put that in a lease, it's, it's mortgage. But that is all a lease is. And now, I mean, we love, we've done class actions, right? We start doing class actions, we see how big we, we do some class action work. <coughs> These 50 page leases you see, you know, like Green Tree is doing in Meridian. I mean, we love those. We just get a client and we say, let's, let's look at how many things in this lease are illegal. Because all those, those 50 page leases are some order, kept getting paid more and more hours to keep adding ways to inhibit your rights. And we've done now three class actions, uh, Park Merced, two against Meridian, one against Park Merced, because they have illegal provisions in their leases that, that take away tenants' rights that they're not allowed to. And then all the tenants of those buildings get a letter saying, um, you know, Lena Ferber sued us, and we're telling you that provision 96 has been voided from your lease. You know? And, yes. Yes? So I was in a place, I was living in for someone, a second name person, and we got evicted and lost. Um, but the previous landlords, and they didn't know who I was, but yet I'd been there for two years. And um, when they settled, um, they um, made me sign something so I wouldn't go after them. But then since then, I found out that the things that they said about me that I was there legally were not true. That um, I, there was a record of me from like, Section 8 that I had a right to be there. The previous landlord had actually cashed one of my checks. All very good evidence. So, unfortunately, in that specifics, I can look at the agreement. But most agreements say claims known and unknown. That's the language. Known and unknown. So, when they get you to sign a release, which is what they're doing, they're likely cutting you off. If there's a specific thing, you, you know, I'm happy to look at your settlement agreement and understand. But the main issue is you get anything. Well, well if, if you sign a document releasing rights. And how long ago was this? About a year, 14 months. Just so you know, it's one of the things. Your rights in San Francisco, the, again, this is not legal advice because, of course, I'm not talking to you individually at all, but our rent ordinance, it has this triple damages and everything else. It has a 12 month right by statute, which means you have one year. There are all these things called statute limitations, one year to file. The local is one year, state law is two years, some are up to five for contracts for like your lease agreement. But the point is, what I really take it for what you're saying is, is the big thing about making sure that you're putting things in writing. Because often the landlord will say, I don't know. The best thing you can do when you move into an apartment is to make sure that the landlord can get to accept money from you. But otherwise, something in an email is, hey, just, you know, it was nice seeing you today, and talk, you know, we try to be friendly about it. Nice, nice talking to you today. I'm glad that you're okay with me living here. But something that says they know you live there. Because always remember that when you get into a dispute, they will say they knew nothing, you never told them anything. It's just, that's, that's, their, that's the number one thing. If it's not in writing, it never happened. So notice is what you're talking about, where they say, I didn't know you were a roommate or a subtenant. And you have to be able to show that actually you didn't know that I was there. And that's what some type of communication will say today. Right? Well, what happened, what I, from, um, I found an, an email from my, that my, um, that the, my client had sent her saying that he was changing his living aid. And she wrote back and said, okay, per, fine, take your time. And I was actually on the contract <coughs> when the building was sold. 
and that can give landlords. I didn't get, get into the specifics, but did, when you were evicted, did you make your way to the EBC? Um, I went to ALRP. Okay, okay. very good. But they, they, ALRP has its own attorneys, but very good. I'm sorry that happened to you, Vince, and I know how hard it is. I tell you, I have a lot of people who find me who get to know me, and then I hear, you know, I, I, like I wish they, they wish they met me sooner, right? And that's why I'm trying to get out there and make sure people understand to find advocates for you. Because you have more rights here than anywhere. And it's always sad to hear a story of someone who weren't able to help because they felt in the past. Well, thank you all so much. Um,